This is possibly the most important vehicle in the last decade. This is the first mainstream electric pickup that might actually be affordable. Well, not this one since it's 80K, but the Lightning starts at 40K. And of course, that's if you can find one and if you're not taken for a ride. But anyway, let's talk about this game-changing truck and what it's been like to live with for the past week. We're gonna start by covering some of the details. What we have here is the upgraded dual motor, all wheel drive, big battery lightning. It's 131 kilowatt hours, and if you don't quite know what that means, think of it this way. It's good for 580 horsepower and 775 pound feet of torque, AKA it's fast as And not only that, the range is good for 320 miles on a full charge. That range number, based on our testing, is actually pretty accurate. And that's even with the AC blasting all week as it's been in the high 90s here in Milwaukee. This being the first generation Lightning, it doesn't get a heat pump, so in winter expect your heater to suck on your range. But at over 300 miles, you have quite a bit to pull from. We'll talk more about charging and battery options in a second, but the important part is the word that's on the side of the bed, and that's Lightning. Pulling from one of the baddest F-150s in history, a fast and furious staple, Paul Walker himself piloted this thing. This thing needed to be quick to bear the name. And it is. Zero to 60 is done in 4.1 seconds. And for those of you keeping score, that is 0.2 seconds slower than the BMW X5M competition that we just tested the other day. This is a 7,000 pound <laughs> pickup truck, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it's fast in this spec, but even the base spec is fast. 98 kilowatt hour pack with a single motor rear wheel drive still makes more power than a Raptor at 452 horsepower and the same 775 pound feet of torque. Zero to 60 is still under 4.5 seconds in the base truck. Standard range packs are good for 230 miles, so while it's still fast, I'd probably go for the big battery. But let's talk about charging real quick. Breaking news, the public charging infrastructure still sucks. There's one fast charger near my house that works and it's impossible to operate the kiosk because the screen is completely covered in some sort of sticker residue or something. It's also supposedly a DC fast charger, so I should be able to get 15 to 80% in about 41 minutes according to Ford. The problem is that charger doesn't always operate at the full 150 kilowatts, so I was seeing about 100 miles of range per hour on the fast charger. Now in fairness, Ford is actively working and dumping millions and millions of dollars into solving this public infrastructure problem, but there's still a lot, a lot to be done and a long way to go, unfortunately. But there's a lot more to this Lightning than going fast and sitting around waiting for a charge. The Lightning offers two-way charging along with ProPower on board. Max output of the truck with ProPower on board is 9.6 kilowatts, which is a huge amount. You have four 120 volt outlets in the bed along with a 240 volt. And then in the front, you have more 120s with a couple USBs that gets 2.4 kilowatt service. The upgraded 131 kilowatt battery includes you getting the Ford wall charger, which is good for 80 amps. So rather than charging a full mount in 13 hours, it's eight hours. And at full battery, the Lightning can power the average American home, according to Ford, for up to three days. Last year, my house lost power for three days and I was trying to call my press fleet manager to get the power boost back to run my sump pub. This fixes all that. But anyway, I'll include more charging notes in the description below, but let's get back to how this thing drives. Now, it's built on an adapted F-150 chassis rather than a ground up EV platform. So it's more conventional body on frame in its nature. It has independent rear suspension though with coils uh, and dampers. So it doesn't ride quite as well as the F-150 Raptor, but it's still pretty smooth. Now, that being said, around town and at lower speeds, you do get the typical truck jitter, uh, especially over the rear axle, but on larger bumps or at more highway speeds, let's say above 45 miles an hour, this thing does start to float and kind of wump around a little bit. And this may be a byproduct of how much this thing weighs. It's like 7,000 pounds, which is a lot, but the fact of the matter is, I'll take the floaty kind of you know, old school boat Cadillac suspension and ride, I'll take that over a jittery, you know, tight pickup truck ride any day of the week. So it's a win for me. We'll talk more about suspension when we go off road, but as far as the driving experience goes, it's a very typical F-150 feeling. 
and I think that's the point. It looks pretty typical F-150 and the interior is very typical F-150 and I think that's intentional to help people kind of transition from internal combustion over to electric. There are some very stark differences though still. The acceleration is equal parts violent and silent. You don't get any propulsion sound to toggle on and off like you would get in the Mach-E. Braking is more eventful, especially if you need to slam on the brakes because again, this thing is so heavy. And the steering is probably some of the most numb and honestly, it's not even that accurate either. And I think part of that comes with the territory of having these range extending tires and the weight. So if you head into a corner with any type of pace, you're gonna get a whole handful of understeer. So it takes a minute to get used to. And if I'm honest, from a driving perspective behind the wheel, Really, the only issue that I have is the steering. Everything else, pretty perfect. Which holds pretty true on the road, but as we head into the trails, we're going to run into a whole other story. We're at Road America. We're about to send this thing through the forest to test some of the agility. Uh, this is a long truck. It's pretty wide, so hopefully we can get through. We are in off-road mode which is basically all you got here, plus a, a locking diff. So we'll see how she does. I'd also like to preface this section by saying we know that this is not an off-road dedicated truck, but it does have an off-road mode, a quote locking differential, as well as general grabber tires. But heading into the forest, this section of the course is not where I expected to run into trouble. We've taken Ram TRX through here, which is wider and just as long. And in the end, it wasn't the maneuverability or traction that was a problem, it was the ground clearance. You get nine inches of clearance on here, and then the running boards eat some of that. So we bottomed out once or twice. And at the end of the day, this was the first vehicle that we ended up having to turn around and come back the way we came, which was an experience that took years off of mine and Paulo's lives. The usual track has a tree down over there, which I'll show you in a second. So we were trying to turn around, which is not easy in this thing as it is so large. So here's our situation right now. Trying not to hit the running board on there, trying not to hit the tailgate on this, and the whole point is that we're trying to avoid this downed tree because this is a lot of rocks and this thing only has nine inches of clearance and it is not built for off-roading. So if we hit anything underneath, so that's we bad. made it through the forest, uh, not the whole forest. We did turn around because, uh, well, even turning around was horrifying, but this thing just needs more clearance, maybe a running board delete uh, and some stronger tires. I think it'd be okay. So I know I mentioned on the road that this thing didn't need air suspension. It might be nice to have a little extra clearance. So if you are going to get this thing and you are going to off-road it, it does, it did fine in terms of traction with the locking diff, but yeah, clearance was an issue. But onto the hills to test break over, approach and departure. And then on the hill section, our regular viewers will know that there are three hills to varying grades to test approach, break over and departure. This again was the first vehicle that we've taken out here that bottomed out on the first and easiest hill, meaning it wouldn't make it over hill two and we weren't willing to risk further damage the, to the underfloor on hill three. Again, what it came down to was break over. How, how did it do? How, how have we done so far today? Extremely stressful and underwhelming. It's not made for this, that's for sure. We're both under 30 and yet I feel like today we're now like 47. Um, okay, so we have completed a hill and we bottomed out with the breakover on the least aggressive hill So we didn't send it on the second hill for obvious reasons and we didn't do the third hill because well If you break out on if you bottom out on the first you're gonna bottom out on the second too So we're gonna go straight to moguls uh, probably not gonna get crazy corked out just because we will tear a running board off of this thing But we'll see how the chassis holds up Finally we tested the moguls it was odd having so few off-road toys to play with in this thing, but after all, it isn't parading around as an off-roader. All we had was off-road mode, the quote, locking diff, and the 360 cameras. And given the underperforming nature over the first two sections, we did end up taking it a little bit easier on the moguls. Though we did manage to get a wheel in the air a couple times, which didn't seem to be a problem for the frame. Over the moguls though, we were more conscious than ever of the weight of the truck. Moral of the story. This isn't, as we said, again, an off-road truck, but if you do plan to off-road the Lightning at all, really the only things that you'll need are some stronger tires with some stronger sidewalls and probably a lift. Ground clearance was really the only limiting factor, but with that test done, let's step outside and talk some fun Easter eggs. 
All right. This thing is pretty impressive, especially for not riding on its own dedicated electric platform. This is sharing the existing F-150 platform, and that's for a few reasons. One is to keep costs down. If you ride on the same platform and you make alterations, it can run down the same assembly line. It can be produced faster with existing resources and existing plants. So that's why they've gone this way. And that's the reason that they can serve up the base and entry trim to this thing at 40 grand, which is a steal as far as I'm concerned. Now, speaking of trims, you get the Pro, which is 40 grand. Then you go up to the XLT. That's probably the most normal one. Uh, Lariat, which is what we have here as tested. This is about 80 grand, which is a lot, uh, but less than something like the Platinum, which is entering your six figures. But let's talk about this thing, first of all, in terms of how it looks. Now, it looks intentionally pretty F-150. It's about 80 inches wide like it would normally be. But up here, you have the full width LED headlight, and it looks really cool. It's not super bright during the day, which is a little bit of a bummer. I wish it stood out a little bit more uh, but you do have this specific grill pattern for your lariat trims all of the individual of the four trims will get a unique uh, finish and texture to the grill now when you open this thing up it takes a little bit to open up while we wait for it to open up i'll talk about what's going on down here of course you have vents up here to cool your front motors this is dual motor all-wheel drive you've got recovery hooks up here if you are to go off-road which obviously we did and could have used those at some point if things got a little bit hairier but once we have a look in here this is the frunk and obviously this is an ev so there's no engine in here ford did a great job packaging this thing this is about the same amount of space that you would get as far as like cubic feet perspective is like a honda accord so a huge amount of space up here plus you have uh, a 2.4 kilowatt uh, Pro Power onboard generator here. You've got four house outlets, USB-C, uh, USB-A, really, really functional stuff. Plus you have additional storage and your cables down there. You've got some cargo netting. Um, so it's a huge amount of functionality up here. It's a huge amount of space. Plus you have that, uh, that generator capability. Now coming around to the side here, we start to talk about the wheels. Now these are 20 inch wheels. They're not my favorite, but they're intended to maximize the range. And same thing with the tires. These are a general grabber tire. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand this way to keep the wind uh, off the mic as much as I can. I apologize if that's coming through on the video, but they're general grabber tires, but they're really, really less aggressive off-road tread, uh, which is something that we noticed. Don't know about the sidewall. That's one of the concerns that we had while we were off-roading, but they're intended to maximize your range along with the wheel option. Again, all of those things, the wheel options will vary depending on your specific trim. Now we get here on your front fender, this is where you have your charging port. You've got your DC fast, and we talked about that behind the wheel. You have a mirrored design over there. That's not functional though, and I almost ripped it off because I'm stupid, uh, but anyway, very typical F-150 profile here. You've got your zone lighting, 360 camera. You've got your dipped front window keypad to enter in. You've got this running board, which is illuminated on the front and the back. You've got about nine inches of clearance, which as we saw, wasn't enough. I think this running board actually eats into the clearance, which is part of the reason that we uh, bottomed out a couple times on the trail. But all the way down, I mean, it's very F-150 looking, isn't it? You do have the lightning badge. It's black and blue on the side of your bed. And then around here, you've got, again, full width LED tail bars. Uh, really, really cool. 360 camera, F-150 stamped in. And then on your bottom right uh, of your tailgate, you have the uh, blue and black kind of lightning electric, you know, American flag badge. This is built in Michigan at the plant, so that's pretty cool. Uh, you do have your, your trailer hitch receiver, 10,000 pounds of max towing, and you have a fully electric all the way down, all the way up tailgate. And then with the tailgate down, you have all the stuff that you're used to seeing and the stuff that we talked about in the Raptor most recently. You've got your ruler here. You've got um, places to put pens and pencils and stuff. You've got a cup holder. You've got a bottle opener on either side, uh, and you have the little clamp wedges that you can use here. And of course, you've got the typical F-150 way to get up into the bed. Now, this has the bed liner, which is, I think, about 600 bucks. Again, I apologize for the wind. This is the least windy day, if you can believe it or not, this week. But of course, you've got tie downs. Uh, you don't have rails in here as installed. I'm sure you can option that if you want, but you do have lighting in here. And of course, you have additional uh, pro power on board out here. The full output of this truck is 9.6 kilowatt hours, 9.6. So you have a 240 volt outlet back here if you wanted to run like your dryer. Uh, you've got additional house outlets back here as well, as well as some lighting. So from a functional perspective, it doesn't get much better than this thing. Not bad, let's go inside. Okay, now that we're out of the gale force winds, we can talk about a couple things that I forgot to mention while we were out there. This does have uh, 
vehicle to load or load to vehicle charging so you can charge other EVs that are uh, out stranded on the road. Uh, for the $10,000 extra extended range battery pack, which is what we have here, that includes your uh, upgraded wall charger that Ford will bring to you up to 80 amps. So that gets you a full charge in eight hours rather than 13. That's a huge difference. Uh, and if you run out of power at your house like I did last summer, you can run the average American house for three full days uh, based on this thing if you have a full battery or a full charge in this thing. So pretty amazing stuff. But speaking of the design as a whole, the interior is very familiar F-150, but of course with the big difference being the big 15.5 inch vertical Mach-E screen that you have here. Uh, even the base F-150, the Pro, or the base Lightning, I should say, the Pro, gets like the big screen that we had in the Raptor. So it's not like you miss out on much if you get the lower, you know, even 40000 I think you're getting a lot of truck for $40,000, I guess is the point that I'm making here. Uh, if you do go up, go up to the Platinum trim, which is the range topper, you can get massage seats. But here you get heated, cooled, you get a heated steering wheel, uh, you get faux wood or some sort of like Hunger Games type design or something. I don't know what it is, but it's all right. Of course, you've got the, the fake denim that Paulo and I fought about in the Raptor. So I guess I, guess I kind of like it. It's very, very fake. It's not super high quality, but it's kind of nice to break up the black. Uh, you do have Blue Cruise on here, which has been fantastic. It's totally hands-free uh, for the interstate stuff. Again, caveat being no car is completely self-driving, so pay attention. It does have the little eye, eyeball wander or watcher uh, behind the screen so it will keep track of you and remind you to keep your eyes on the road if you're on your phone or whatever but no i mean it's the screen is basically like what you get in the in the mach-e which we've covered you get wireless apple carplay you've got dual glove boxes over here uh, you've got your digital instrument cluster which is a, a 12 inches and it's fantastic uh, it's not overdone there's not too much information but there's enough for exactly what i need uh, in here, your head unit, you've got your drive modes. It's interesting, you only get four drive modes though. You get normal, sport, off-road, and tow haul. So no like eco mode or range max mode, that would just be the normal mode. Uh, you do have a button to toggle on or off one pedal driving. I've left it off the entire week because I always hate those and we've talked about those before. And of course, on your off-road setting, uh, you do have the option for the locking diff, which of course, you know, that's just a dual motor uh, setup, so it's not a locking diff in the conventional sense. But you have really cool stuff in here. Uh, you've got your onboard scales to tell you exactly how much your payload is up to. You've got zone lighting stuff we've talked about in the past, 360 cameras, which have been very good, uh, especially for the off-road application. That was super nice to have. We've got the Pro Power onboard screen. Uh, you can set up a, a power floor. So you can set it to where you don't want the truck to drain more than like you know, up to 40% of the battery, 30 or whatever. So it's not like you're gonna drain your truck completely overnight if you have it, you know, charging your house in a blackout or something. So that's kind of nice. Uh, the bottom part of the screen, I'd say the bottom third probably, maybe it's a quarter, but uh, it's always up there with your, your HVAC stuff. So you can always toggle onto your heated seat, cooled seat, steering wheel, uh, fan speed and that sort of thing. It's always there, it's super easy. Uh, to use. And then of course you get cool stuff like your auto parallel park, you get a wireless charger which I would expect especially with wireless CarPlay, uh, you get more chargers up in your dash 12 volt and normal 120, uh, you get your uh, gear selector which folds down and of course your center armrest that folds open to a desk which is you know kind of one of the most slap in the face obvious things that you could add but hey thank you for bringing it to us ford um you get double cup holders they're not big enough for my emotional support water bottle but that's okay because it fits in the door bins plus it's it's it works to have an extender in here um so it's fine you get a bang and olufsen sound system 12 speakers it's very good and then you get this massive pano roof which is fantastic and the front part even opens up uh you don't get that in a lot of a big pano roof so that's really nice to see uh, and it does have a sunshade, so you can close it, unlike the Mach-E does, which doesn't have anything. And then the rear seats themselves are huge. And it's very, again, it's very F-150. A lot of this stuff that we've, we've talked about in this video, we've talked about in other videos, so I'll link more in the description below. But your seats fold up, you've got that added cubby, you've got a flat floor, you've got rear vents, rear chargers, uh, and you have two level heated seats in the back. Plus you have the little power rear window. So again, it's very F-150 the experience the design the materials it's it's meant to be conventional and even that goes for the outside design it's it's meant to kind of ease the transition from internal combustion f-150 to lightning and i think it does a phenomenal job and really the biggest difference is just the big center screen which we've had experience with in the Mach-E and I think it works pretty well here and it suits the nature of the car. Uh, but even the downgraded screen is, is definitely still good size. So overall, I'm impressed and I think with that we get into the final thoughts. 
I know I mentioned this at the top of the video, but I think it's true that this is the most important vehicle in the last decade, and it's not the first to do it. There's a Rivian R1T out there, the Hummer EV is out there, and the Silverado EV is on its way. But as far as right now, to be able to get a mainstream truck and not a six-figure super off-roader, this is wildly compelling. At base, a 40K, it's unbeatable, but it quickly gets more expensive, and a lot more expensive. The next step up over the Pro is the XLT trim, which starts at 52K, but it's another 20 for the big battery. Same thing with the Lariat is 67K, and it's gonna be another 10 for the battery. And then the Platinum is 90K. As tested, we had the Lariat with the bigger battery, and we tested the truck at $80,589. So is it perfect? No, but it's a very strong example of where we're going from here. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.